In this video, we're going to begin to talk about section 7.1. What is a sampling distribution? We're going to define a sampling distribution. We're going to show you what they look like and how to actually use them to evaluate certain claims made about um, uh, products, uh, what people say in newspapers, magazines, and so on. First thing, we're going to distinguish between a, what's called a parameter and a statistic. Okay, They are similar, but the one difference is that they describe different groups of items or objects or people. So a parameter is a number that describes some characteristic of the entire population. So if you had every single person in the state of Michigan and you found out all of their heights and you find found the mean height, that would be your mu of the entire population. That would be a parameter. Okay. The problem with parameters is that we often don't get them because we don't have the resources or time to actually evaluate an entire population. So what we do is we take a sample, a small subgroup of the population, and we find some number to describe it. That is called a statistic. This is a number that describes some characteristic of a sample, the smaller group of people. We use statistics to inform us about what the parameter might or might not be. So because we're not able to do the entire population, we have to use a smaller sample and the statistics from it to inform us about the population parameter. Some notation. If you're talking about mean, for your population mean, it'll be mu. For your sample, it's going to be x bar. If you're talking about proportions with qualitative uh, variables like colors, favorite cars, um, uh, and so on, dem or uh, political parties, parties, use proportions. This is your population proportion, just a plain p. And then for the sample proportion, it's p with a little hat on top, p hat. So population proportion, sample proportion. So this example, every March, the government's current population survey, CPS, asks detailed questions about income. The random sample of about 60,000 households contacted in March 2012 had a mean total money income of 69,000 677 in 2011. Is this a statistic or a parameter? Mean total money income of 69,677. For you to answer this, you need to decide is the $69,677 describing the small sample or the entire population? Well, the mean comes from the sample of 60,000 households. That makes it a statistic. You're talking about 60,000 households, not all the households, the entire uh, nation. So this is your sample. Therefore, this number is a statistic. It is a mean, so we use X bar. So figure out what the number is describing, either the population or sample, and then move on to per parameter or statistic. All right, sampling variability. If you were to do that sample multiple times with different households of 60,000 or 60,000 households, if you do that multiple times, you're not going to get the same mean every time. And that's okay. That's what's called sampling variability. It's the value of a statistic varying in repeated random sampling. So the more times you sample something, you're going to have a variation of what the statistic is going to be. And that's going to create what's called our sampling distribution, which we're going to find out in a few seconds here. So in this situation, we have a bag of poker chips or playing chips. There's 200 total, 100 are red, and 100 are blue. The sample size is 20. What is the sampling distribution of red chips? All you have to do to create that is to um, sample multiple times of size 20 of the chips and then put them back. And what you get is the, um, each time is the proportion of red chips, you just take the number of red chips and divide it by 20. So for example, if you sample 20 chips and you get 12 red chips out of 20, your p hat value is 0 0.60. If you do that many times, you get this graph here. So this graph represents the sampling distribution of p hat or the proportion of red chips. Okay, And you can see it's kind of centered right about 0.5. This makes sense because half of the bag is a hundred red or half the bag is red chips, a hundred out of two hundred. So it makes sense that this distribution is centered around 0.5. Now, not all of them are 0.5, it varies. That's the sampling variability you see in a distribution. Some as low as 
or 0.7, but you'll notice that the further you go away from the center, the less likely it is to happen. There's only one sample of each of those um, with those proportions. The majority of the samples fall in this range here, right centered around 0.5. So you're drawing 20 chips at a time and finding the p hat proportion of red chips, and that's how you get this distribution. Okay. Shape, center, spread, it's almost symmetric. The center is at 0.5, the approximate mean, we'll call it that. And this makes sense because just p by itself is 0.5. And the range is 0.2 to 0.7. So we have none that are, you get all black chips or you get none that are all red chips, somewhere in between 0.2 and 0.7. So the distribution, sampling distribution, is called a distribution of values taken by the statistic in all possible samples of the same size from the same population. I want to clarify some things. The distribution of values just means all the different possible values that p hat can take on, taken by uh, or the statistic, which is either p hat or x bar, in all possible samples. I've underlined that because that's not going to be possible for you to do. For that example, you have uh, too many possible samples for a human being to actually take out of a 200 chip bag. So you're going to approximate the sampling distribution with a few samples. So it could be 100 samples, 200 samples, 300 samples, so on. But you can't do uh, the number of samples that are possible because it's way too big of a number. It actually is 1.6 times 10 to the 27th power possible samples. So that's a billion, billion, billion you're never gonna be able to achieve that. So we're gonna approximate the sampling distribution by taking a fewer number of samples. So why not graph all of them? Because there's simply too many of them. We can't do all possible samples. So we're gonna approximate the sampling distribution by taking you know, a number less than a billion, billion, billion. So we usually just create approximate sampling distributions all the time. So whenever you see a sampling distribution, it's always approximate because we can't really graph the entire sample distribution because there's too many samples to do. Okay. All right, so if we use computer software, we can produce 500 simple random samples of the same situation. So I do more random sampling of the same size, n equals 20, from the same bag, 200 chips, 100 red, and 100 blue. And I'm still taking p hat every time. What's the proportion of red chips every sample? This is what a 500 sample distribution looks like. About the same shape, but you'll notice it's more symmetric the more times we do it. And we have uh, some more extreme numbers here, but they're very, very unlikely. So a p hat of 0.15 happened one time, this one dot, out of 500. So the first question I ask you is a single dot at 0 0.15. What does this mean in terms of the situation? Well, that means p hat is 0.15. And that means 15% of the sample was red. That's three chips out of 20. That's a very unlikely uh, event happening in this entire distribution. There's 500 total samples here, and it happened one time. Describing the distribution, we'll say symmetric or approximately normal, the shape. The center looks right at 0.5 right here. So the mu of p hat is 0.5. Spread, the range is 0.8 to 0.15. Subtract those, you get 0.65. So a little bit larger than the other range, but the majority of the data is right around 0.5 here. This question asks you, would it be surprised to get a sample proportion of 0.85 or higher in an SRS of size 20 when P equals 0.5? That's the situation right here. 0.85, as I've pointed to with an arrow here, there's no dots representing any samples there. So out of 500 total samples, none of them achieved a p hat value as high as 0.85. So it would be very surprising. So since there's no data near the proportion, it would be very surprising for that to happen. Okay. And just a reminder, regular p is population proportion. So p equals 0.5. That is from 100 chips out of 200 chips being red. That's half. All right, number four. Suppose your teacher prepares the same bag and claims that half of them are red. So now you're in a situation where you don't know what's inside the bag. You know that there's 200 and the teacher is claiming them at half of them are red, exactly. A classmate takes an SRS of 20 chips and 17 of them are red. What would you conclude about, conclude about the teacher's claim? 
Well, I would first determine what the p hat value is for 17. 17 out of 20 is 0.85. Now, we just said getting a p hat value when half the chips are red of 0.85 was very surprising or extremely unlikely because out of 500 samples, it didn't happen. So if this event is so unlikely it didn't happen in 500 times, you could say, if the teacher's claim is true, then this is an extremely unlikely event. But because it's an extremely unlikely event, you can essentially say, teacher, your claim is most likely false. This provides the basis for inference testing. When we start saying, this is too unlikely for it to happen by chance, something else is going on here. So we're gonna say that there's actually not half red chips in the 200 chips. We're gonna say this is probably more than half of that. All right, so here's a diagram just talking about what it looks like to sample from a population. This is our big population distribution, half red, half blue. P equals 0.5. What you do is you repeat samples from this population. And every sample you do a P hat value. So in this sample was 8 out of 20, 0.4. That goes on the graph. So one dot at 0.4 and you put it right there. You do it again. P hat value, 0.55. Put a dot at 0.55. And you repeat this sampling many times over and over and over again until you get a nice distribution. You combine all the p hat values into one graph and you approximate the sampling distribution because we're not able to do every single one because there's way too many. We approximate it with whatever we can do. If it's 500 samples, 1,000 samples or whatever. What's key here, sample size is 20 for each sample. You cannot change n in the middle of a distribution. You could do two separate distributions for two separate sizes, um, but if for one distribution, all of these dots have to have the same n value or sample size. Okay, so what we did in the previous page with the uh, teacher example claiming that half the chips were red was we're evaluating a claim, okay? We're gonna use statistics like that to evaluate claims of other um, statements from companies or people, okay? And this is an example of that. So this says Mars Inc. says that the mix of colors in its M&M's milk chocolate candies is 24% blue, 20% orange, 16% green, 14% yellow, 13% red, and 13% brown. Should we trust the percentages that the company gives us? Below is a sampling distribution for orange colored M&Ms. Look at the features of the graph and determine if it matches up with the Mars Inc. claim about color distribution. So they've done a sampling distribution for uh, orange colored M&Ms proportions. So each sample, they found how many orange colored M&Ms there were and divided by the total uh, in the sample. And they got this distribution. Now. Their claim is 20% orange, or 0 0.20 for the population. If you look at the graph though, at 0 0.20, there's not a single sample that was that low. The majority of this centers around 0 0.40. So this has evidence saying that their population proportion that they're stating is false. It's more likely to be closer to 0 0.40 because that's what the sampling distribution is spread around. And in fact, there's not a single sample that says that it's 0 0.20. So when you evaluate the claim, you essentially use the evidence in the sampling distribution to say, is it true, possibly true, or is it possibly false? So if this were the true population proportion, 20%, then the center of the distribution should be 0 0.20. So this graph should be centered around this number here and not 0 0.40. This distribution centers around 0 0.40. I would say don't trust Mars Inc. statement. So if you have an unlikely event happening, and they're claiming that it's 0 0.20, you can essentially say that's false. That's not gonna happen. Now, if their claim was it's 40% orange, that would make sense. Even if it was 36% or 43%. That range that's possible, we'll talk about in later chapters. But right now, I was gonna say, is it gonna be most likely false or most likely true?